to the uh, Everyday Men's Conference. But um, I appreciate the opportunity. And uh, when Cass came to me uh, some time ago about uh, maybe speaking, and I was excited about that. And then later on, he gave me a topic. And uh, I thought, yeah, that, that's, that's, that sounds like a great topic. And I, 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 I can work on that. But he gave me the topic, well, not gave me, he said, think about the topic of love. And I said, yeah, there's, you know, love, that, that's a great topic. You know, it, it's a theme throughout the Bible. We know that. Uh, it's an attribute of God. Uh, it's one of the fruits of the Spirit in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. So I said, yeah, that's it. But then the more I looked at it, the more I thought about in the context of this men's conference, I thought, I would focus more on brotherly love. So that's how I kind of came to, uh, to the topic of brotherly love. But I think it's, uh, the, the Greeks had, you know, some different uh, words for different types of love. So we're going to briefly look at some of those and then we'll get into brotherly love. But, but I was thinking about love and, you know, us men, we can say to our wives, you know, we say, honey, I love you. And then Two minutes later, we're saying something like, I love football, or I love, I love whatever, that car, or I love tacos. I mean, it, we're all over the board. So love is a very flexible word with men. So I wanted, again, to focus on brotherly love. But I'm going to open up with a story, and uh, you'll understand a little bit more why I'm telling the story. But... Um, in 1569, there was a man that lived in, in the Netherlands, and his name was Dirk Willems. Not Williams, but Willems. And Dirk was uh, in prison for his faith. And Dirk, uh, the reason he was in prison for his faith, a lot of people considered what, what he believed to be heretical or even illegal. Now, what landed him in prison? The, it, the main thing was the fact that he did not believe in infant baptism. And he was in prison. He happened to be in prison in a, in a castle, if you, if you can believe this. It was, a, it was first constructed, as I understand, a castle, and then it was converted into a prison. So here he is. He's in this prison. It's in the winter of 1569. It's freezing cold. And he decides that he's going to take some cloth, and he ties cloth together. And he, he forms some kind of rope and he lets himself down from the upper level of where he was. Now a castle, as you know, has a moat around it. And it isn't winter time. He gets down to the bottom, it's frozen, he easily makes his way across. And then he begins to run. And he sees freedom, freedom on the horizon. But then soon after that, he was being pursued by, by someone and he began, began to run faster. So he gets to a place and he finds he's actually on top of a frozen pond. So he runs faster and he gets across. So luckily he made it across. But his pursuer was on top of that pond and halfway across he broke through the ice and began to, you know, possibly drown, freeze to death, the bitter cold. We said it was a very cold time, but this man began to cry out for help. Now Dirk was faced with a, with a, he had, he had to do something here. You know, most of us, some of us, I don't know how we'd all act, but, you know, if we look at that through the context of the golden rule, what, what would we do? Well, Dirk decided he was going back, and he was going to go back and help that man, and he pulled that man out of the water, and that man latched onto him, grabbed him, took him back to prison, and long story short, it didn't end there for him. He was burned to stake for his faith. And that was, that's an example of agape love that, that Dirk showed for this man. Loving someone that was out to harm you, he, he showed that love. And I thought something else was interesting. It said, when he, when he was being burned at the stake, it said, they heard over like 70 different times of him crying out, oh God, or my God, and, and the wind carried that to this, this uh, local town. Now, I'll get, I'll get to my story, uh, get to my point here, but what I'm saying is, you know, sometimes people do things to us 
that are that don't feel good. It doesn't make us warm and fuzzy. It doesn't make us uh, like that person anymore because they treat us pretty rough. But here Dirk decides to go back. And there, I also heard that you know a lot of these the Anabaptists. He was an Anabaptist, and then that was so. Uh, you know, that means someone that is baptized again or rebaptized. But he, there were a lot of the Anabaptists that were killed for their faith, just like Bert, Dirk was burned at the stake. A lot of the men were burned at the stake, but a lot of the women were drowned. One last thing about this story, because I was just fascinated when I was reading it, it said that they began to clamp the tongues of the Anabaptists when they would be burned at the stake to keep them from crying out their boldness of their faith. And here he is, faced with something like that. And I, I wanted to read something to you. Uh, you don't have to turn there. But uh, in Luke chapter 6, verse 27, But I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. Uh, to one who uh, strikes you uh, on the cheek, offer the other also. And from the one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold from the, your tunic either. Give to everyone who begs from you, and from one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. And as you wish that others would do unto you, do also unto them. There's that golden rule, right? And then verse 32, if you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to, to and if you lend to those uh, from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back in the same amount. But love your enemies. Do good to those who uh, do good to, and do good and lend expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great. And you will and you will be sons of the Most High. He is uh, kind to the ungrateful and the, and the evil. Be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. A little hard for me to read there, the light. A little darker here, but, but uh, agape love. I just wanted to talk about that first because agape love is one of the noblest and highest of the love that we see. It usually tops the chart. It's the kind of love that you do something not expecting anything in return. It's the kind of love that, that you would do, like we said, for an enemy, that you would even reach out to someone that was harming you, or that you'd be, you'd love them enough to, to, to help them out, you know, to show the love of Christ for, for people like that. It's a sacrificial love. You know, going back, I, I, I keep thinking about Dirk there, and I think about him going back that man that had fell through that ice that was pursuing him. Most likely he could have you know, kept going and got away and maybe been a free man. But it's the kind of love, again, I said that, that we don't expect anything back. We do something to help a, a brother in Christ that we don't expect anything back. We just do it because we want to do it because God tells us to do it and we're satisfied with that. And that's the reward that we get for doing it. Um, it's the highest and noblest of love mentioned in the Bible. And I think of Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrated his love toward us while we were sinners. He died for us. And it's the kind of love that God has. Anyone who does not love God does not know God because God is love. That's 1 John 4, 8. Agape love is much more than a feeling. It's an act of the will. Agape love was... Uh, was also shown at the cross. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that, who's, that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And you know, I think of uh, agape love and how powerful it is. And I'm going to go on really quick on these next two and then we get to our main, our main type of love tonight. But I think the next type is eros. And eros is a type of love that's a, uh, a, a 
romantic, a, a sensual love. Uh, it's where we get the word erotic. And it's the kind of love that uh, happens within the institution of marriage. It's the love between one man and one woman. No other combination works. A man and a man, no. Woman and woman, no. It's the, it's the relationship. Eros is found in the institution of marriage. And I'm, I'm so, um, I'm so, I, I love how Avenue Bible stands on that. And Pastor Jason, some of his message, Pastor Paul, uh, when Jason was away and talked about Avenue Bible, what we believe about uh, marriage, uh, gender, and all those things. A lot of these things today that year, years ago you'd never even think about, but they're here. And we take a stand on them. We go on uh, to the, the next kind of love. It's called storge. And Pastor Jason, if I mispronounce these words, call me out. But uh, storge is a, a, a love that you have for your family. It's a love that a, a, a dad would have for their son. It's a love that a dad would have for his daughter. And that's the love that I have for my daughter. I mean, I, I love my daughter. And that relationship there, that love that you have like that is a very special thing. I'm, I'm about to experience a, a new kind of uh, love there uh, in that regard as far as Storge is concerned. Um, our daughter is due to give birth most any time. And I was uh, kidding with Cass a little bit, so if I get up and run out the door, you'll know I got the call. But, uh, but I've heard many people talk about how the, you know, you don't know until you experience it. And, uh, and by the way, I want to publicly take a minute to thank each one of you that pray for our daughter and continue to do that. But I say that, that I wanted to get through those three types of love to bring us to Vallejo love. And that's what uh, brotherly love, and I want us to focus on that tonight. Uh, brotherly love, there's some words that we get from phileo or philia. We think of Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love, right? Think of philanthropy, uh, the love of uh, humanity or mankind. Think of philosophy, the love of knowledge, wisdom. Now, some men in here might argue that a 12-ounce filet mignon is a special kind, <laughs> but that's not. That's not. But, but I, you know, but it is. Uh, brotherly love is a command of God. Look at the first two commandments. Filet love is the kind of love that you have for your close friends. And I look in here, and I have some close friends in here, and I, and I, you know, that brotherly love that we have. It's a special thing. It's a very special thing. I'm an only child. My wife's an only child. Um, and when you have no siblings, your church family becomes just a little more special. And as we live our lives and people pass away, and you don't have the family that you look around and see some others. Oh, they got five, six brothers, sisters, and they got this huge family. They got this big network. And here I am. So what I'm trying to say, brotherly love in the context of the church is an absolutely beautiful thing. And I don't take it lightly. Uh, it's, it, it's, a, it's a blessing from God. I first experienced phileo love here shortly after I came. And I got invited to a men's retreat out on the lake. I went out there not knowing a lot of people and just kind of, you know, kind of sitting around. Next thing I know, I was at a campfire talking to people. Uh, Kevin playing his guitar and, and getting to meet people and, and just a lot of things. I saw, saw the love of a lot of these men in here and it, it, was, a, it was a beautiful thing. But phileo love is a very, very special thing. It's a gift of God. You know, there's a crazy thing that a lot of times Men, I don't know what it is. I guess we're just hard-headed or I don't know what the word is. But a lot of times men just can't tell another man that they love. And what I mean by that is brotherly love. Now there's 
There's a couple other Greek words for that. Hogwash and baloney, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> because there is nothing wrong with telling another brother in Christ that you love them. I'm going to stand here publicly and tell every one of you that I love you guys. I do. It's brotherly love. But what does the world try to do? The world tries to twist that around and make it like, oh, you love that man? You're strange. No, I love that man because he's my brother in Christ and I dearly love him I, with a phileo type of love. So it's a very, very special thing. You know, in a biblical context, it says uh, we, we're, we're to count others more important and we, we're, we're cheering them on. We're, we want them to, to, you know, to do well. It's not a competition of I want to be better and outdo you. It, no, it's a come along and cheer everybody on. I thought about Matt. I was in his session and Matt was talking about how he's not a public speaker. I totally disagree with that man. He is. He did a great job. And I'm telling you, we need to cheer each other on. We need to. Have you ever been cheered on by another brother in Christ? How's that feel? But you know what? When you cheer them on, that's you don't do it to have this good feeling, but you you share that and you get as much as a person being encouraged. That's God doing that. It's not us. Think about uh, Christian churches exist because of the love of God, love of Jesus. And when we show brotherly love, all it does is it just strengthens and and builds up the church. And, and uh, you know, have you ever been someone just give you some encouragement and you're having a bad day? And I don't know about anybody else in this week, but this week has been just one of those weeks that was absolutely, for me, everywhere I turned, it was just, I almost felt like the devil was after me or something and uh, trying to make things hard, trying to get here today, and just everything. It was one of those weeks for me. But, you know, you come together you join with your, your brothers in Christ and it just helps you. It truly helps you. True brotherly love is not self-centered. It's sacrificial. It says in 1 John 3, 16, by this we know love, that he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. Romans 12, 10, love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another. In showing honor. Now outdo one another. We know what that means. It doesn't mean in the, like outdo. I'm going to outdo you. No, it's, it's an it's a encouragement. Encouraging them on. And then we look at this verse here. So she, Mary Magdalene, ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. That's phileo love there. And said to them, they have taken of the Lord out of the tomb, and we do, do not know uh, where they have uh, laid him. You know, we think about phileo love in the Bible, and I think about um, one one story that rises to the top, I guess, is the story of Jonathan and David, and the, the friendship of brotherly love that those two men had together is a beautiful thing. It says... Uh, the soul Jonathan was knit to David and, and, he, and he found out that his dad King Saul was going to try to kill David and what did he do? The Bible says they sat together and they weep and, and he, he, it, it was a very special thing and I, I've, I've heard and I know y'all have heard a lot of times the world tried to twist that around like some kind of strange relationship between those two men. No it wasn't. Brotherly love. Leo love. A, a concern for your brother and it's a beautiful thing. A beautiful thing. Phileo love is not a love. Uh, phileo love is not a love that we have for our enemies. You know, someone trying to hurt you, harm you, hate you, you don't. You, you're not gonna have that phileo love. That's a agape love when you try to get to that. Part. But you know, a beautiful thing happens sometimes when we show agape love to someone like that, and you that person begins to see see us. You know, something different. What, what does that person have? What, what's he got? The next thing you know, through the way we live our life or share our testimony or just being around someone and helping them, encouraging them, and next thing you know, 
we share that phileo love. They've come to know Christ, and then we're, we're, we have that. So it's a beautiful thing how God works through all of this stuff. It just it amazes me. Here's the thing. I said earlier that sometimes men don't know how or can't say I love you. Just can't do it. But you know, when I thought about that, I thought there's sometimes there's other ways that men can say I love you as a phileo type love. What if you drive a Christian brother uh, or go out and drive a Christian brother to a doctor's appointment and he's unable to drive? That's phileo love. You know, what if you mow a yard for a friend that's having chemo treatment? He can't get out there and mow it. He'd love to be mowing it. But you go out there and mow it for him. That's, that's, a, that's a phileo love. You know, what if you host a life group and, you're, and they meet in your house and you open your house up to them, you know, every week and you come in and show them the love of God? That's a phileo love. You know, recently um, I've seen some people encouraging people, deeply encouraging people through prayer that was going through a very difficult time. And that's phileo love. Me personally, as I tried to cloud through my mind and <laughs> cloudy mind and try to look back, and I guess one of the strongest times that I felt phileo love in my life was back in 2005. And some dear friends of ours um, had just a terrible, terrible tragedy to happen. Um, a mom was driving along, had her two little daughters in the car. She had an automobile accident, and her little six-year-old daughter, first grade, was killed in that automobile accident. And her older daughter saw her, saw her die. And the next day, I went to the hospital to cheer on, not cheer on, but support my my brother that had just lost his his little girl. I remember going into that that room and his wife was in some kind of procedure having done from the from the wreck and and I remember walking in was, and a couple other guys were there and I remember walking in and not really being able to say a whole lot. I was able to just say I love you. I love you. And the other men there a lot of was, was dealing with the same thing. They, they just couldn't is you didn't know what to say. You didn't know what to do. But you know, you dearly love that guy. And you cared for him. And he was there for him. Um, finish up with one, one uh, book in the Bible that I've mentioned, Jonathan and David. And how that one kind of rises to the top of phileo love. But another one that, that really I think about a lot as far as phileo love is concerned, is the book of Philemon. And I think about, I think about Paul, rewind back to when he was referred to as Saul, and how he was on his way to have Christians arrested, beaten, abused, whatever, I don't know, maybe get, what, killed, but, but he sure wasn't showing too much brotherly love, was he? Not at all, far from it, far from it. But think about, fast forward, he's converted, and he's now found himself in a prison in Rome. And happens to be Onesimus, this slave that has stolen from his master that makes his way to Rome, and all of a sudden they somehow come together. And I think it'd be neat to if they had recordings and you could watch it, it'd have been fun to have that and put, put that tape in and watch it. Can't you see? And, you know, they're sitting in that prison together and, and uh, Paul maybe asked Onesimus, well, what are you in for? Well, I stole from a master and I'm on the run. You know, I stole from Philemon and back in Colossae and here I am today. And then he said, well, what do you do? I'm a preacher of the gospel. And I was like, oh my goodness, <laughs> can you imagine how all of a sudden he said this to him and, and then he begins to 
they begin to share a long story short he he comes to faith and Paul has this phileo love for him and he cares for him deeply and he matter of fact didn't want him to go back but he sent him back to Onesimus and Onesimus I see had a phileo love because he cared for the church that met in his house he cared for him deeply he cared for the slave that came back so that's the kind of love that we're thinking about but um I want to close up with what my my hope was for this uh, rambling on here tonight. But my hope was, my desire through this message is to encourage each of us to show love in a world that unfortunately too often shows anger and hate. And all you have to do, turn on the news, pick up a newspaper, and if you don't believe me, try it. You will find a bunch of hate in this world. You'll find men at their, each other's throats. You'll have society going mad. But then in the midst of that, Christians, we can let our light shine and show the love of Christ. Uh, we'll show anger and hate to give hope uh, when many people seem hopeless. I've never in my life seen a lot of people, I've heard people talk about, it just seems hopeless a lot of times. It's a wonderful opportunity to talk to people and show them what the true hope is about. Let's band together as Christian brothers and show people the love of Christ, but also let's show our Christian brothers that we love and support them. It's life changing. It's changed my life, changed your life, and we know it can change others as well. So step out and show brotherly love to people uh, around you. I'm going to close with one passage, and, and then we're out of here, fellas. I know it's late. Some of you got up really early tonight, and I appreciate you staying around. But I'm going to close up with, uh, we all know it, but I'm just going to read it. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. If we speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers, and I understand all mysteries and all knowledge. And if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. Uh, it is not irritable or uh, resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for the knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the, pain, the, the partial shall pass away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face, now I know in part. Then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. And then here, we we'll close up with this. So now faith, hope, and love abide. These three, but the greatest of these is love. Yes. Fellas, I just wanted you to think about brotherly love tonight in the context of this, this uh, uh, conference workshop and how I've already seen it at work tonight. And... Uh, it, it's a good feeling. It's a good feeling. And I uh, appreciate the opportunity. And um, I really I want to thank the people that's worked on this so hard, Cass and Scott, Pastor Jason and Pastor Paul. Anyone's had anything to do with any of this, I thank you for it. And I think it's a great thing. I've been highly encouraged here today. So I am under 30 minutes by 30 minutes right now. So I'm fit. <laughs> thank you.